The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And Jesus replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, It is now the third day since this took place. Some some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and said, and, and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all of the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on further. But they they urged him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those to whom were sa- and those with whom were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he had made known to them, he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, Adam and and Noah and Megan. It's beautiful music. I love that song. So my journey is not one of dramatic conversion or uh, miraculous events. I've never witnessed a miracle. It's really been more one of just gentle pulling and um, nudging. To know my story, you really need to understand kind of my whole story. So I'm going to get into some details, and I hope I don't get into too many details, so bear with me. You know, I didn't grow up Catholic. Um, 
I didn't even, for the first 19 years of my life, I didn't even know God at all. We go to church only if we were with my grandparents or with my uncles, and I had no idea what any of it meant. Um, but I, I did have really good parents. Um, they, they taught me right from wrong. They taught me to be respectful and to treat others nicely and to work hard. And also, probably most importantly, that we're all created equal. Um, you could probably say that I had the commandments just drilled into me except for the first one. There was no God in any of it. So I grew up for the first 19 years of my life not thinking I needed God in my life and really just um, thinking I was on this walk by myself. Um, and I just needed to work hard and be a good person. Um, but looking back on it, I realized that Jesus was with me, walking with me through all of it. I just didn't recognize him. So in my freshman year of college, I, I, you know, I started to think about why am I here? Why am I in this universe? Uh, who is God? Um, but I didn't, I wasn't like actively pursuing it. I was just kind of wondering at that point. And the, the summer after that first year of college, I worked at this golf course. And um, I was out working on the course one day. It was actually a really hot day. And I was spraying the greens down with this wetting agent that we use when it's hot. And um, I got pretty thirsty. So I see the drink cart. And uh, I go over and I, and I ask for a Coke. And it turns out this year that um, the, the girl who drove the drink cart was new. And um, so I, I asked her for a Coke, and, um, you know, she, she tells me, um, I'm sorry, you, you know, you, you have to go in to the clubhouse to get a fountain Coke. And, well, I was pretty sure she was wrong, but uh, it turns out they'd changed the rules. So anyway, um, I, you know, I didn't... I, pretty much avoid conflict, so I didn't really want to do much about it, and uh, I just went back to work. And, uh, but about 15 minutes later, I see that string cart again. It's heading towards me, and sure enough, um, the, the new beautiful drink cart girl brought me this fountain Coke. And it doesn't sound like a big gesture, but it was important to me. At that time in my life, uh, I was pretty insecure, especially when it came to meeting girls. And, um, you know, I was really the shoulder that the other girls would cry on and they'd complain to me about their boyfriends. And, um, but this was a, probably the first time uh, a girl had done something nice for me. So we got to know each other more, better throughout that summer. And um, we went golfing and we'd talk a lot. And I'd look forward to seeing her every chance I could make an excuse to do it. And um, eventually she realized that I was insecure enough that I was probably not going to ask her out. And, and so she asked me to take her fishing. And actually, I was a pretty serious fisherman, so when we went fishing, I took her fishing, I was trying to catch fish. And um, I, I was hoping she liked me, but I wouldn't let myself believe it. I was only 19 and she was 21. And anyway... Um, it took me a little while, but eventually I figured out she had no interest in catching fish. And um, so she made it very clear to me at the end of that fishing date, um, the next move is up to you. Those might have been her exact words. And so finally I knew that she was interested in me. And so we started dating and um, uh, getting closer. And but before you knew it, uh, summer was gone, and she was back to Purdue, and I was in Rolla, Missouri at school, and we were long distance. But we got to know each other well enough that um, we, we kept that relationship alive, long distance. And there were long distance phone bills, and um, you know, we learned how to chat on the computer. And, um, and uh, 
getting to know Amy um, meant that I got to get introduced to the Catholic Church and to Jesus. And um, before you, you know, I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. Um, you know, um, by the end of college, we're engaged, and um, we start the RCA program, and I learned that if we want to get married in the church, that um, I have to become Catholic. And I was totally okay with that, you know, because I was authentically interested in having religion in my life by that point. And um, so I went through that process. And I'm going to fast forward again. Um, so when we got married, um, when we were kneeling in front of the altar, um, I remember vividly um, this tremendous warmth uh, and tingling all over my body that I've never ever had felt before or since. And uh, I knew at that point, you could say just like in our story, my eyes were opened. Like I knew Jesus was there. He brought us together. He was part of that union. And, um, you know, when I was reflecting on this to prepare my testimony, I had this picture of us kneeling in front of the altar and like Jesus just kneeling right behind us with his arms around us. And it, it just this picture in my mind um, that I can't get rid of, uh, and I don't want to. <laughs> but um, so that was a tremendous experience for me, and you'd think at that point I would just be all in, but no, I wasn't. You know, I kept things still on my own terms. Um, I didn't go to Mass every week. I kind of just went when it was convenient, if I felt like it. And um, my faith really wasn't growing that much. So I'm going to fast forward again a number of years, um, and uh, we have two wonderful daughters. You know, ha having children just helps you recognize that only God can provide something like that. And I was back on this road to Emmaus again, you know, so the story of my life is just being on this road to Emmaus and off of the road. <laughs> and back on the road. Um, but when our oldest was nearing time for her first communion, uh, we made a commitment that we were going to go to Mass every Sunday. And, um, and we did. Um, and I, as my daughters were growing, so did my desire to learn more about my faith. And I was growing at the same time. But, you know, I was... I had a lot of growing to do and still do, but... Um, I was reading the Bible, but not really comprehending, kind of flailing around with my faith, if you will. And, uh, but, you know, I know Jesus was there with me through all of that. You know, at that point for work, um, I would go on these, these uh, long trips to places like Arizona or Colorado. And, and going to Mass every week was so instilled in me by that point that I would... Um, I needed to go. So wherever I was, I would find a local parish and I'd go. And um, I remember uh, leaving Mass one day in Flagstaff, Arizona, and on the table in the back, there were all these Matthew Kelly CDs. Um, and uh, they were encouraging me to take them, so I took one of each of them. And, you know, when you're on these long test trips and you're driving a lot, you get tired of listening to music. And I listened to those CDs for the rest of the trip. And it blew my mind. He, he simplified the faith for me, and he made me excited about it. And, and it was just an amazing moment for me. Um, but still, it was a slow conversion. So about four years ago, uh, Amy was helping out with uh, faith formation, and for those of you who know Mary, know, know Mary Jo Davis, she, um, she asked Amy if I might be me, if I might be interested in helping with the EDGE team, um, with the middle school boys. And, 
and you know, Amy told her she didn't know. And honestly, I was pretty terrified at the thought um, because I felt like I was just growing myself. Um, and so I prayed about it, and I, I didn't know if God was calling me to do it or not, but I gave it a shot. And um, I, I'm so thankful that I did. You know, honestly, there were times when I didn't think I was qualified, but I don't, what I've learned is that's not one of the requirements. Um, and uh, so I'm back on this road to Emmaus again, right? And honestly, there were times um, when I felt like I was at the same basic level as the kids in, in the room. Um, and so... Uh, I know I felt this need to keep developing my knowledge because it bothered me that I didn't, I couldn't answer some of their questions and I, and I didn't know what to do. So anyway, um, one night I, I, I found Catholic Answers Live on the radio and, it, and that got me on a path that, that found resources for me to, to help me uh, try and be a better edge leader. Uh, being part of the EDGE program has just been a huge blessing for me. Um, I, I get to work with an amazing group of people, and, um, you know, we share experiences, and uh, I learn a lot from them. And I, I look forward to it every, every time we have EDGE now. You know, the other thing that it's done, when you, when you get to go on a confirmation retreat with these kids, you know, as adults, we're, we're kind of weighed down by all the, the things in this world, but you go on a confirmation retreat with these kids and you see them encounter Jesus authentically without all that baggage, and it, it just can't help but, but um, deepen your faith. So I know that was a long testimony, um, but my conversion has been a slow process. And looking back, I realize that I've been on this road to Emmaus so many times in my life, and I've even op had my eyes opened and recognized Jesus. Um, but I get distracted, and I lose my way, and before I know it, I'm back on that road again. And the thing I've learned is that Jesus is always going to be there with me, uh, and I can count on him. And he's been walking with me all along, and even those with me. You know, um, for me, Jesus was there uh, with my parents raising me, and he was driving, riding in the cart with Amy when she brought me that Coke. And he was there with his arms around us um, as we kneeled in front of his altar. And, you know, he, he was there in a delivery room when our daughters were born, and he whispered in Mary Jo's ear to convince her to ask Amy if I'd be interested in helping with Edge. And he's with us at these Edge nights and on retreats. So you know it seems like throughout the Gospels Jesus is walking somewhere so I'm getting convinced that he likes to walk. Uh, and that's a good thing for me uh, because I've done plenty of it. So, you know, the good news is I know that I can depend on him every time I'm on that walk. And the amazing thing is that, you know, just like me, um, this, you know, just like my story, this is your story too. He, the, the people and the events and the places, they're all different. But, but just like he was walking with me, he's also walking with you. Thanks.